much to Sophia Luisa's So Zoom In. You are a Vegas, a, Vegas, a Las Vegas icon. Um, you've been around and seen a lot of things happen. You have so many stories to tell. And you have written a book called Vegas Player that kind of shows a little behind the scenes um, what has happened in your life. And I would love to talk about that and talk about what you're doing now in Las Vegas, where it's over 100 degrees. And you look fabulous, by the way. You look absolutely amazing. Um, oh. Vegas has done you good. <laughs> You're so kind. Thank you. So how are you doing tonight? I'm doing fine. And how are you? Oh, I'm doing, I'm excited to have you on my show. You know, I, I know um, a lot's been going on and you're going to be playing live at the AOF Mega Fest in July, right? Right, right. Okay. You know, I remember in 2019, the last mega fest I was there, I had the chance to listen to you play. You are an incredible jazz player. Um, Thank I, you. I bought your book and it has the DVD of your music as part of it. And you know, you are you are legendary. So I have to ask, what inspired you to write your book? Uh, how would I say a lot of people? A lot of fans, people that I've known, even people that are not with us anymore, <coughs> felt that I had such an incredible life experience that I should write a book. Well, you know, I would agree with that because when I was reading it, it read like it could very well be a movie. And you, okay, you start off in Ohio, in Youngstown, yeah. Ohio, correct? I actually, I actually know people from there, um, so that's pretty cool. Now, I would love to hear the story of how you got into playing music. How I got where? How you got into playing music. Um, being absolutely from a poor, poor Italian neighborhood, mm -hmm. and my dad decided that I was going to be a famous musician on his own. Uh -huh. And he went out and paid $387 for the best saxophone he can buy. It took him six years to pay for it. Uh -huh. And with the stipulation that if you, you go out and learn how to play this, and if I ever see you walk into a steel mill, I will break your arms. I, so you better go out and learn how to play this, make something out of your life. Now think about that for a minute. <laughs> so somebody's gonna buy your horn and, and go out there and make something out of your life. It's, it's pretty rare, you know. Right. Yeah. And that's how I got started. That but so you're, you're a young kid, how that make you feel? You know, being told that you're gonna do this, I mean, did you How did that make me feel? Yeah. I mean, were you down it made me feel wonderful in the sense that he thought so much of me, and I, I you know, eight, being eight years old, mm -hmm. that he would spend that. That to me was like tons and tons of money. That I, I you know, that was a lot of money in my brain. Right. And he took go out and spend that much money. And thought that much you're making me trying to make something out of my life. It made me feel great. And I became so dedicated. Mm. And he, he's the reason I became what I did. Mm. Because as I thought about it, mm. even the, the hero of my book is not me. The hero of my book is my dad. If you read about that and then you start thinking about what I did in that book. <laughs> and you think about him, he's, he's the star of that book. And uh, a lot of people have said that. So you're not the star in that book. Your dad is the star of that book. And, and I, I, really, I really believe that. He was, yeah, he really motivated me to, to be something because if you notice in the book, his side of the family they were so, how would I say, 
just unfair with him for going out and buying me a saxophone. Spent to them three hundred eighty-seven dollars spent on an eight-year-old boy was throwing money out the window that nobody had. Nobody had any money. Right. I was, you know, do you think about depression? Mm -hmm. And you going up seven miles away, bumming a ride to go to a golf course in Caddy, and come home with two or three dollars, spend six, seven hours up there. That's that's what kind of money we had. Nobody had any money, so he got he really got put himself in a pickle, and uh, all of his family got angry at him, and so on, and so forth. So that's how I got started. Uh, how did you learn? Did you take music lessons, or was that part of school, or did you teach yourself? How did you learn how to play the saxophone? Oh well, then <laughs> he found uh, this friend of his who played the. In those days, uh, a lot of Italian older fellows came, that came over from Italy played the accordion. Mm -hmm. And he looked up his friend and asked him who was the best saxophone clarinet uh, teacher mm -hmm. in Youngstown. And we found out who it was. It was a guy from Rome, Italy. Mm -hmm. And uh, he went down there and, and, and he talked to him and he, he got my little two, two lessons a week. Oh, wow. <laughs> a dollar a lesson. Oh, wow. A yeah, a dollar lesson. And then at times, you know, at that time, they used to have strikes. Uh, the steel mills would go on strikes, and they would have no money at all. Mm -hmm. And this Italian teacher would allow me to come in and take lessons with no, for no money. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. So it was qu quite a place to be brought up. In. It was unique, I would say that. So would you say you had a natural talent for playing or was it something you had to work hard for? No, yeah, I had a natural, natural talent. Uh, I, I just, I became like a phenom. Mm -hmm. I, I, I was doing things at such an early age. Uh, it, it just was so natural. But I was putting a lot of four, five, six hours a day in it. Right. And you, you figured out when you're eight years old, eight and a half, and you're putting that much time into it. You know, that's it. Well, you have to. I mean, if it's a passion of yours, and it sounds like your dad really wanted you to do it. Yeah, like, and that's why I said, being indebted to him for him going out and wanting me to be something. That's what motivated me to do that. That's why he, he was he he was the star of my life, my dad. Oh. Now, when you went to Vegas, would he ever go be with you or watch you, or did he know yeah, about? Yeah, yeah, well, you know, it's it's a funny funny thing. When I was at Ohio State University, I was there for one year. He gave me eighty dollars to go to Ohio State University, and the tuition fee at that time was eighty dollars. After I gave the eighty dollars to get in, I had no more money. So I found out where I can stay at a fraternity. Now you gotta understand, Italians don't understand anything about fraternities. We don't know anything. Phi Kappa Lapa. I mean, that that's like a joke, you know. It's uh, and we, even today, I don't even know what it what, what it means to be in a fraternity. And but I went there and I stayed up in the attic, no no air conditioning. Uh, nothing, no heat, no. And he, eating uh, mayonnaise sandwiches and, and peanut butter, and you know, you <laughs> have no money. I mean, well, see, yeah. a lot of people don't understand what life is without money. But God has a way of making you survive, helping you survive. Right. And all I cared about. So anyway, I got into Ohio State University. And I took an audition. I would make sure to say it was over 225, 230 mm -hmm. clarinet 
majors auditioning for the Ohio State <coughs> Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. And here I come in. Now you understand how, how well prepared I was. Mm -hmm. And I was well prepared. Now you, I, I figured my dad gave me $80 to get in here. And again, having no money was a big motivation. Right. Because you get a chance to do something. Anyway, mm -hmm. make a long story short, I became the solo clarinetist in Ohio State Symphony. Oh, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's and, and you know, from that time, and, and I was there for one year, and I got very tired of mm -hmm. the weather, right. uh, being in the Air Force ROTC, which is not why I went to Ohio State. Right. And going down to Ohio State Buckeye, Oh, oh my goodness, who's that young man there? <laughs> Dell is joining us. He's there he is. Yeah. So, Dell so you played the clarinet with the Ohio Symphony as part of the course, yes. right? Okay. Hi, Dell. Hi, beautiful. How are you doing? Thanks for, so much for joining us. I'm talking Did with you. I Dr. love that you're only shooting the top of Jimmy's head. That's beautiful. He's on his phone. Well, put, point the phone down. What is he, slow? What's the point of, Jimmy. He is, he is chillaxing in Las Vegas. Jimmy, he, did you get younger? Oh my God, you look good. You're like a candy bar to me. He looks great. Oh, he's sexy. Please continue your story. I didn't mean to interrupt. Please continue. Oh, so thank you for joining us. So Jimmy was telling me that he was in the Ohio um, Symphony playing the clarinet. He was the only clarinet. He, play, he was the only one who played clarinet, he, the soloist, right? Ohio State Symphony, yeah. Ohio State Symphony. Now you, all right, he's just a natural talent. You are a natural talent. Now you also play the flute. When did you start playing the flute? Uh, actually. Two weeks after he met me. What was it? I said two weeks after you met me. <laughs> uh, when my dad bought me a saxophone, uh, he bought me three records uh, to listen to, Stan Kenton, uh, Woody Herman, and James Moody, one a black saxophone flute player. And that's who I fell in love with, James Moody. Mm -hmm. And that's how I, I found out what a flute was. You mm -hmm. know, you, you understand that nobody comes to you and says, this is a flute. Right. You just, once you become a, exposed to something and you, as a young person and you figure, well, I'm, I'm learning how to play music and I'm hearing this great jet black a jazz musician playing flute. And to me, it was like so delightful, so invigorating. So when I found out what a flute was. At eight years old, I eventually found, I, I can't remember how, how old I was when I got a flute, but I got it quite young in my life and, and I became one of the world's great flute players. So I don't, I don't remember how old I was. I can't answer your question. Well, it was no, quite early in my life. It sounds like you just pick up these instruments and they just, it just comes to you naturally. I mean- Well, nothing comes natural. You, you have to have a desire. Well, but it seems you like you have to have a desire. You have to have a a goal, and you have to know why you are trying to achieve what you're achieving. Achieving to again, it goes back to my dad. Right. No matter how you look at it, uh, I had such such indebtedness to make him proud of me and and get those his family members off his back. I just felt I'd do everything I could in my power to be, be as great as I could. It so sounds... nothing, come, nothing comes natural. When you pick up a bassoon when mm -hmm. you're 14 years old, I mean, that is like a whole different world. Mm -hmm. And you know, picking up a bassoon is like trying to drive two cars at one time. That's how hard that horn, that instrument. Oh, yeah. So anyway, uh, I was trying to just direct you in the right direction, and nothing comes natural, nothing. 
you know, Jimmy, you're giving such great information, but the phone is so low that we can't see your face. Well, I don't know you gotta, what to you do. You got to get rid of the headroom so we can see that beautiful face. Yeah, now you're talking. Now we oh, okay, great. Thank you, brother. More of that big, beautiful head. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, oh, okay. You, I have to ask, how did you guys meet? You know, this is a note. Jimmy, you I was at the I was at the Tropicana and I had been drinking. I tripped. And I Jimmy's passed out. You must have been, I don't know what oh, he, don't no, listen he passed to him. out. I I trip and I fall onto his sex and he said, oh, Don't listen, touch listen. my horn. I and I said, lying. Oh man, <laughs> you probably can't even play this. And he picks it up and he starts playing. And I, I teared up, and the next thing you know, he's working at AOF and, and befriending me and supporting me and loving me in a way that no one ever has. And it's just been the most wonderful relationship since then. I got to tell you, we met through a great guy named Mark Giardino, a really great man who's been phenomenal in my life and to my family. And I should have been better than him, and I will be one day. But Jimmy was a result of that, of that relationship with Mark. And my God, what a great friendship it has been. Oh, my God. It's funny because... See, he's right now, the place he's at, it's a private golf club, which yeah. people like me can't go to. And I'm not there right now. I wanted to go there. I wanted to have a nice meal, but I'm not allowed. Thanks for nothing, Jimmy. Well, Jimmy, you play golf really well. I mean, that's one thing that you mentioned in your book is that you learned all these great skills about playing golf, right? right. Now, what a great right. time. Uh, right now, I'm 100 yards away from where Mark and I uh, met, maybe less than 100 yards. Okay. I'm at the country club right now, about a hundred yards away. And um, we, I will never forget that meeting. It, it was so instantaneous. When I met Mark, it was just bam, bam, bam. It was like we were friends forever. And he's been one of the greatest friends I've ever had in my life. I, I love the man so much. He's such a beautiful person. Beautiful and he put person. us together. Oh, that's wonderful. All right. And then so, ran. so you guys are working on a project. <laughs> you guys are working on a project together right now, right? Um, not well, you know, I call Jim. Okay, so let, let's be clear about what this project is. So a couple of things. Jimmy has played for us for a couple of years at AOF. But the, the, the process is that Jimmy is not a musician. Jimmy is an experience. Yes. So think about uh, the greats like... Uh, um, Everyone thinks Miles Davis was the, the greatest musician, but he wasn't. Miles Davis was the greatest personality, right? Because at the right time, the right circumstances, the right racial issues, and the right hatred match with a great entertainer and a talented man, and you get something special, right? But Miles Davis is dead, right? Eartha Kitt, gone down the line, Dizzy Gillespie. He played and knows them all, but they're gone. He's still here, right? He's an experience. He's like a like a 300-year-old bottle of wine, right? You don't just share that. No, no, no. You don't just share that over a common dinner with tacos. You've got to have a primary eight-course meal with people who you really love. And that's what Jimmy Mulledore is to music as opposed to being fast food, conventional service that they learn one way of playing and then they play. Jimmy plays the notes that don't exist between the notes that no one else can hear and that's why he's special, and I'll be quiet now. Sorry for that. I love very, that. Very well put. I mean, and it takes a special jazz appreciation listener to be able to explain that. And Sophia, I tell you, uh, Dale is is that person. He really is. He he knows his music, and one of his favorite songs is Dave Rubick's "Take Fire." Five. And when I play that, I can almost feel the tears in his eyes because he loves that song so much. And that's that's one of the songs that brought us together. Yeah, well, it's, it's not just a song. I keep telling people it's not music. It's an experience now. Music is what you hear on your radio. Music is what you stream through your Internet. Music is what we used to. That is what used to be a record, right? Jimmy is something different. You cannot hear the note. The note does not record. The note lives. He plays living, breathing music. And when you bring someone a recording of that, it's nowhere near close to the experience of it. And I say this only because, again, 
I've seen the I saw Sinatra. He sucked at the end. He's hor he horrible. The band sucked at the end. And I love Sinatra. I saw Ray Charles at the end, and he was horrible at the end. I'm Jimmy is older than all of them alive, and he's only just beginning, I think, to touch the, the surface of his talent. Because I go to his house and he plays privately for me in his room. So I get to hear the 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 things that that go into the creation of perfection, not just the perfection, right? And when he plays, I want people to understand, it, I used to travel and do a lot of management. I managed a lot of great people in my life and traveled with them and did great shows, but it was the experience of the person, not necessarily the format or the item they were using. So it may have been music was their tool or martial arts or writing or artwork. That's what they were selling. But the experience was the creation of that thing. And you don't get that on, on a recording. So Jimmy's, a little bit different. And he didn't just play take five. He recreated take five the way that Dave Brubeck wanted it played. But Dave Brubeck doesn't have the talent to get there. He did the exact same thing with, um, and I hope he'll play this year uh, somewhere over the rainbow because that has become known as somewhat of a gay trope, right? But that's not what that song was about. And so it became something other than what we first heard it and, and recognized it to be. Jimmy plays it as it was meant to be played. And I think that's that's the beauty of a Jimmy Mullador, of which there's only one. He's an endangered species. So you've got to honor that. So By the way, when they killed Coco the gorilla, I didn't shed a tear. But when Jimmy Mullador dies, I'll be crying for the rest of my life. He's going to be around for a long time, though. Yeah. I don't know. I've been considering going over to the night and taking him out. I don't know. I'm getting <laughs> a little bit angry toward him. <laughs> only Vegas knows. There's only love here. Only love, especially when we're talking about. What happens in Vegas? <laughs> hey, so, um, so Jimmy, do you compose your own music too? When you just start playing, do you just start? Yes, I do. I, I, I do. You know, you know. But again, that big word is motivation. Hmm. And living in this uh, Las Vegas is not a motivated motivation town to record. I've done, oh gosh, uh, maybe maybe 25, 30 DVDs, recordings, et cetera, et cetera. I got so many things on, on YouTube and so on. And I don't, I'm not involved with the record company anymore, which is kind of sad because right now I'm playing better than I've ever played before, but there, there's uh, no motivation. So composing my music, is there's no motivation, Sophia. I, I, you need to have, like, you would take, like, Miles Davis was recorded with Warner Brothers. Okay, maybe five, six, seven, eight times a year, he would go into the studio and do a jazz album with the finest musicians in New York. He would be motivated to write one or two or three songs, then he'd have other great musicians that work for him write originals. But over here in, in Las Vegas, this has become a one horse town. It's not really a great music town. So again, to answer your question, I, I don't compose because I'm not motivated. So what would, what would motivate you? What would inspire you to start? Creating? I just told you, if I had a record contract with a great company, Yes, I would be motivated. I would be writing my behind, and I have, I have like I twelve. I have twelve CDs out there. I've written about maybe eight to fifteen of my own originals, and yes, that would be motivate me to write my own music. But to go home, um, to go home right now. And, and sit down and, and write my own music. I keep asking myself, why? Why? What, what, am, I, what am I gonna do with it? Well, you know, if okay. I had a record company that was gonna go out and produce it and, and distribute it all over the world, huh. it'd be a great thing to do. Just like I would like to write another book. I have so many, Dell Weston knows more stories uh, about me than most people do. I've told, I've get, given Dale more stories of inside stories through mm -hmm. our lunches, luncheons, and so on. Dale wasn't going to write another book about me. <laughs> well, well there's, it's a little bit, 
It's a little bit different. What happens is that Jimmy has been gracious. And Jimmy, you know, this is a great interview. If you would just keep that camera on that pretty face and not on the top of your head, it'd be great. There, yeah. I look like a like Charlton Heston about to have sex with Pam Greer. <laughs> anyway, um, that's uh, Omega Man, just so you know. Uh, but what Jimmy is suggesting is this. I've tried to do something that most people won't do anymore. And that's find a person who's a little bit older than me and find a person a little bit younger than me. And then with those two tools mm -hmm. and those two experiences, I will, I'm always fuller than I would be if I only was in one stage. And I think a, a lot of young people, they did a, they did a study that I think that it came back 60% of young people had no faith in God. And they also had no faith in authority. So they have no direction. And what I'd be like, Jimmy, gives me a connection to all that history that I will never experience except through him. So when he's telling me these stories, I said, Jimmy, you know, I want to, I want to do an option for your book and for the movie. And so I'm creating a, a beautiful pitch deck for the Jimmy Mullador story based on his book, the Vegas player, as well as other stories that he's let me in on. And I got to tell you when people like Jimmy uh, move forward, you lose everything. Right. And I think that younger people don't understand when you've lost everything that came before you, you have no basis in the understanding what your future could be because you have no past. And so I want to maintain my past and people like Jimmy do that for me. So I want to honor him with this, 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 this uh, production to try and make this happen the way it should be done. Right. And not just the way that the book said, because the book only has, you know, the partial truth. I keep telling you, the, the, the truth is in your words, not in that you speak, not in what you, what you wrote. What you wrote, people will read forever, so you won't tell the whole thing. Right. But what you say, I know was real because uh, your heart is in this and your love is in this and your life is in this. And that's why, Jimmy, I think you should keep writing music because those things are in there and someone will be served by them uh, more than you can imagine. Joshua Tree um, is my theme song but only the way Jimmy plays it. That's beautiful. So has, has the script been written? Is it something that- We have a couple of people who are circling. Yeah, uh, beautiful. And then I have my version. Well, I'm a little partial to that one because it starts out with the danger of Jimmy Mullador and not the music of Jimmy Mullador. See, I, I think that people don't understand something about a survivor and a talented survivor. When you're talented, there's always some, someone coming after you. He has no equal. He's like the alpha predator with no other, he can live forever. He better. So he's, either a giant, he's either a giant tortoise <laughs> or the Omega Man. And I think he's some, I'm going to go Omega Man. You know, he's, the, he's a slow survivor, man. But that skill and that talent set and that experience, he's the only one. Nobody else. Well, it has to be made. It has to be you made from what I read. In the I agree. Book, so visual and you, know, you need to be a part of it. And I think you need to write the music for it. And I think you have so Thank much you. inside of you. It needs to come out of you. So to hear you say you're not motivated, right, actually kind of hurts my heart because <laughs> hearing you play and listening to what the music comes from you, it sounds like it's, it has to be like an endless flow. You just have to keep doing it. And I, I think there's magic in you. So I feel such love when I hear you play too. So that's why I was so excited to get you on the show. So thank you. And thank you, Dal. You know, well, I I'm going to step off because Jimmy has stories that you and two, you two should share. And I should not be a part of that because I'm so passionate about him. I want to be his big cheerleader, but he needs to talk. And your audience needs to meet him without my presence. But Jimmy, I would just ask you to keep that phone where we can see your face so people can get to know you and that the show looks like a much higher quality show. And thank you both for allowing me to be here. I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Dell. And I look forward to having Jimmy at AOF Mega Fest. He is. Oh, you'll see him this summer. He's coming. We'll see him. You'll see him in six weeks. All right, cool. I, All right, guys. All right, thank Love you. you thank you. Have a great show, and thank you. Right, Love, Love you, Dell. Love you guys. Bye bye. Well, Jimmy, thank you so much. Okay. All right. So Dell is a wonderful, and I think he's a wonderful writer too. So I really want to see this film come to life. Um, what would you like to see in your life's movie? Say it again. What would you like to see in your life's movie? Okay. What would I like to see in my life's movie? Is that what you asked? Yes. All right. Can you well, you know, 
I could probably add so much more to the, the book itself. In mm -hmm. other words, the book is, is just an outline of things that have happened in my, my life. Mm -hmm. And if that book was done by a, a, the proper movie pro production company with a good budget, we can make such a dynamite film because there's so much to add to each each story in that book. And like I said, I, Dell has gotten a lot of the inside stories that I've added on as we've had our luncheons and our talks. And I've elaborated more because, you know, it's, it's hard to get it all down on, on the paper. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to, you know, if that ever became, I mean, there's so much to add. I can't, it, it's like playing a, a jazz solo. You can't write it down. You can write a little bit of it down, but uh, every one of those scenes in that movie would be so elaborated. It's, uh, that's what I would like to see. Right. And it could be, I mean, it's, it's, Every, in other words, everything in that book is so honest. Mm -hmm. There's, there's no, there's no lies in the book. There's no exaggeration. Everything there is honest, and it's alarming. Have you read the book? Yes, and okay. I, I have to admit, I'm, I'm kind of fascinated. Okay, first of all, you're, you're in Vegas during the heyday of it, when, when I feel like Vegas is really coming alive. You know, when you had Elvis Presley and the Rat Pack and. You know, you had all these beautiful goddesses as actresses like Anne Margaret. And when you wrote about her in your book, I'm like, wow. <laughs> so I'm thinking that would, um, I, I'm like, whoa. Um, just like, wow. Okay, so you, you were very sexy and you're still a very, very sexy man. You just have that quality about you. Um, what would you put those kind those relationships with women? Would that be like a strong storyline in your movie? Because you had a lot of beautiful women in your life, and the one with oh my god! I mean, Sophia, <laughs> I, I can't tell you. I I, I don't know why. Yeah. Meeting women has always been, and beautiful women. Right. I mean, I I, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I must have been very, very attractive. There's something about Italian men that are who are arrogant, and of course, being a performer and playing on stage. I mean, I came from, I grew up next to you read the book. I grew up next to the mafia, and mafia like Joe Pesci's, and people like that, the Humphrey Bogarts, and all my relatives, my uncles, and cousins and all of the, my mafia friends, we all had that same kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. And for some odd reason, women, a lot of women like that. No, they're all women like that. If you, if you were from Utah, you may not like that. But if you were from a New York woman, yeah. you might really like that. Yeah. And I, you know, like when I, and Margaret came to rehearsal, <coughs> and uh, you, I, I got to be very careful on, on the air because, okay. as she, make a long story short, I was yelling at one of my cello players mm -hmm. during the rehearsal before she started to sing. And we were re re rehearsing a song right before she started, and I was yelling at a woman cello player. And from some odd reason, we never had met before. And she said, why are you so mean to your uh, violin? She thought it was a violin player, it was a cello. Mm -hmm. And I looked at her and I said, none of your business. I never met her. And the reason I could be that arrogant is Baron Hilton, who owned the Hilton, and mm -hmm. Henry Lewin thought I was God. I mean, I had my own string group. I mean, I was the conductor of the shows. Elvis thought I was, the, I walked on water. I mean, believe you me, I, I had everything going for me. So I, there's nothing, no, nobody could harm me. Nobody can get me fired. So anyway, I said, I said, there's none of your business. 
just leave me alone. Anyway, after she uh, uh, got through singing, uh, Stand By Your Man was one of the songs. She said, what do you think? And I said, well, I, I'm going to change the wording a little bit. You'll have to look it up in the book. She says, well, what did you think of that? And I said, well, do, do you, Sophia, do you know what a vibrato is? A vibrato, no. What is so it? if you were vocalizing mm -hmm. and you sang a note, say, stand by your man. So if you use a little vibrato on her, make the vote waver a little bit to make it sound more attractive. Instead okay. of saying, stand by your man, you would make a vibrato in it. Right, okay. Well, she couldn't get it fast enough. It was very lab laborious. Uh -huh. So she said, what, do you, what did you think? And I said, your vibrato sounds like a dog. I'm going to use a change of word. <laughs> bumping a football. Okay. I, use a, I, use, I use a different word. Read the book, right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and <laughs> she said, that's terrible. I said, well, why did you ask me then? You asked me what I thought. I said, you got to remember one thing. I don't lie. I said, if you want to learn how to sing a little faster, come down to my dressing room or otherwise, let's move on and we'll re rehearse your show and get on with this. So anyway, okay. our lady, she came down to my room and with 20 minutes, our romance started and it went on for seven, eight years. And that was the end of that. That, that is what I'm, I'm telling you about. Uh, my type of personality, you either loved it or you hated it. Right. So okay. that went on with Raquel Welch, uh, a lot of lot of women. Right. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to sit here and be a braggadocio of right. women that I, I've made. Like, that's not why we're on here. Right. So I mean, women, I went to bed. You have to read the book. <laughs> but, and I think that's part of the music, too, because when you play the music, you know, it becomes so much of you. You know, it's it's you're it's very sensual in a way. I mean, it doesn't matter the way you are part with the horn, you know, and you're just creating. That's sexy. That is just really sexy. Well, uh, thank you. Now, you you know, Dell mentioned Miles Davis. Mm -hmm. Now. Miles Davis's wife, mm -hmm. Frances Davis, got tired of getting beaten up by Miles. They were living on the floor below Diane Carroll, a great performer in her own right. Mm -hmm. And while Diane and I were, were performing together at the Sands, mm -hmm. Diane, Karen came to me, she said, I got somebody that wants to meet you tomorrow night coming in from New York. And again, what we're trying to portray is, is why I had so many women, because I was like Miles Davis in a sense. Miles, you know, I, I don't, the only difference between men is I didn't beat women. Miles was a nasty person. But when he played his trumpet, he dressed to the nine. I mean, he was unbelievable as a dresser. He was lean, mean, and sexy. And women felt crazy over Miles. But anyway, uh, when Miles' wife left him because of getting tired of being beaten up, which I did, never did the woman. And, and, and she was uh, one of the <coughs> few, few that I, I had... Uh, 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 quite an, a nice an affair with for quite a while, and you know, and, and she liked me because I guess I was similar to Miles in a sense. Mm -hmm. So, I'm trying to answer your question on what what made me so attractive oh. to women. Yeah, I don't know if I'm doing a good job. I'm trying. Being a young man, talented, you're in you're in Las Vegas. You know, it's just like it. It seems like it was just part of it. Um, and it sounds like you're having the time of your life. You know, you were- I did, I did. You, you know, I, I got away with murder in, in a sense. Like for instance, how can you explain working at the Sands Hotel with the likes of Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Lewis, Sammy Davis, Red Skelton, Diane Carroll, 
uh, Betty Grill, everybody that worked at the Sands Hotel, the band leader, Antonio Morelli, who was associated with the mafia, Sinatra could not get Antonio Morelli from not conducting his band. He could not get him out of there. That's how powerful Antonio Morelli was. And for some odd reason, he grew a fondness for me. And he even told my mother and father, he says, I never had a son, but if I had a son, your son, Jimmy Mulligan, would have been the perfect son for me. Anyway, I went so many times I tried to quit Antonio. I, he would never let me quit. So one night I went to him, I said, and I called him Anthony. And most people would not dare call him Anthony. His name was Antonio. I said, Anthony, I said, I I'm, I'm going to leave the band. He said, why? I said, a red skeleton comes over here. He's on for two hours and 10 minutes. And I, I got to go to the bathroom. I can't sit here for two hours and 10 minutes. Frank comes on. He's on there about an hour and 55 minutes. Sammy's on for two hours. Jerry Lewis is on for two. I said, I got to get up. I said, I can't sit here for two. I got I, I can't sit here for two hours. Mm -hmm. He said, well, go to the bathroom. I said, so you know what I did, Sophia? What's that? During the show, I got up. I got up and went to the bathroom. Good for you. Well, but, but think about that, though. Think about that. That show's going on, and this this arrogant person, me, getting up during the show with Frank or Dean, doing their show, and I'm getting up, walking off the stage, going to the bathroom. Now, how many people can get away with that? That's, I mean, that's the kind of person I am. Okay, so so you go to the bathroom and you come back, or what happens? Oh, oh right. yeah, I'd come back, come right. back, sit in my chair and play the show. Okay. And and to the bewilderment of the guys sitting in the band, looking at me like, what in God's name does this guy have? <laughs> I mean, we can't even, we wouldn't dare open our mouth with Antonio Morelli, and this guy's getting off the stage and walking off, going to the bathroom, and coming back during the show. So I'm just giving you an example. I had the time in my life, yes. Good. I really did. I had the time in my life. But you have to read about Henry Lewin, oh. how he took me to Washington to play for Ronald Reagan and Gorbachev uh, with Danny Thomas, who I almost married his daughter. Mm. Uh, it, it, it's incredible. I mean, I, I've had so many ins and outs in life. Uh, I can go on and on. You might want to go back and read the book again because there's some things you, you're going to read about Betty Grable. Uh, that, that, you so know, just what? Who was the love of your life, or who is the love of your who life? Who was the love of my life? Ah, uh, you know, I've gotten so. That's a good question. Who was the love of my life? My, my first wife, I was madly in love. You know, I've gotten so burnt, yeah. uh, cheated on, and so on and so forth, that I refrain from even naming anybody that was the love of my life. I, I, I'm so disillusioned mm -hmm. with women being distrustful, uh, lying, uh, robbing. I, I've gotten, I'm, I made so much money, Sophia. Look, I don't have the money that I make. I've gotten robbed by my sister, uh, my relatives, friends, uh, ex-wives, right down the line. So my my uh, love of my life doesn't exist anymore because I don't trust anybody. And it's hard to trust because they, to my way of thinking, mm -hmm. women lie. They lie. And if they lie to you, how can you trust them? How can you allow yourself, your feelings and everything to go to them? Because they just keep lying and lying and lying. So uh, whoever I had the love of my life, I find it very hard to believe them anymore. <clears throat> so I, uh, I can't even give you anybody who was the love of my life. Right. So would you say music itself is, is the love of would you say Would you say music? Is the love of your life? Is uh, oh, of course. I've devoted my life to music. 
I, I, I would I would love even right now to have a, a woman in my life that mm -hmm. I could adore, love, and trust, and be with uh, as much as I can. Mm -hmm. But I I don't know. It just maybe it's not in the cards. It's just not there. You never know, right? You never know. As long as you have your music, though, right? Well, I got my music, uh, and when I'm playing my music. That elevates me. Okay. Um, being appreciated by some of the greats in music is that, that's quite a feat. Yeah. Uh, you you can compare it to like two boxers, say like Muhammad Ali mm -hmm. and Joe Fraser or, or George Foreman, and they like today I got a call from a a saxophonist named Eric Alexander. Mm -hmm one of the all-time greats in the world. And he called me up today to tell me about a drummer that's moving to Vegas and mm -hmm. could I help him out and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> during our conversation, uh, he said, you call me Superman, which I do. He looks like Superman. He's about six foot two or three, very mm -hmm. handsome man, uh, wonderful, wonderful saxophonist one of the best in the world and he says you know there's only one jimmy molador mm -hmm. i said oh come on he says come on now he says you played me off the stage the last few times we played i said but eric come on you were drinking he says no 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 he said no no he says you are one of the all-time greats and i and i still talk great about you all the time which Sophia made me feel wonderful. Now you're talking about, like I just gave you an example, like Muhammad Ali, George mm -hmm. Foreman, uh, Joe Fraser. When mm -hmm. one of your cohorts call you up and say that to you, that means a lot to you. Right. Because they play the same instrument. They play jazz. Jazz is not very easy to play. Wow. And when somebody like that, you know, and musicians are very envious, jealous. Uh, they're not very uh, complimentary mm -hmm. and, and, and they don't give a compliment. So today I feel very good getting that phone call from Eric Alexander. That's so that some of those things like that really mean a lot. And of course, when you have people like Dale Weston in your life, mm -hmm. it means a lot, you know, and I don't know, I, I have, I have some nice, beautiful friends in my life now and We'll see what happens, but. Right, you never know. You, you never, never know in life. You just keep going. Well, have you always wanted to stay in Vegas? I mean, if you had the chance, if you had the opportunity to live wherever you wanted, where would that be? Or would you prefer to stay in Vegas? Um, you know, I have a beautiful home in Rosarito, Mexico. Ooh. Right on the beach, you're at 5,000 square feet. Mm -hmm. Right on the beach, right on the ocean. And I haven't been there over a year. And uh, when I get down there, it's absolutely gorgeous. The problem is, I can't get anybody that wants to go with me to Mexico. You speak Spanish? I, I really don't know where I would like to like to go because uh, it takes an effort and a reason right. to want to go somewhere. I don't want to go somewhere where it's cold anymore. <laughs> I'm not up for that, you know. <laughs> but, if, if, you know, if I were up playing somewhere music, I, would, I could adjust to that. Okay. I certainly don't want to be in, in February in Chicago. Oh, God, no. <laughs> in New York, I'm, I'm not up for that. I don't need to put up with that anymore. Right. But, I mean, I could live in Florida if I had to or somewhere like that, I guess, you know. Okay. But right now, I'm... I'm Content here. I am a member of a country club here, living oh. a good life. You know, How often do you play golf? Every day. Oh. I'm here right now, uh, right at the country club right now. Uh, and do you play? Uh, do you play golf the first thing in the morning or the evening or? No, 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 no. Golf fits into to my schedule mm -hmm. only when I wanted to, uh, and I don't play eighteen holes of golf anymore. I play four, five, six, seven, eight holes until I get bored. Okay. And once I'm done, I quit. 
Yeah. And that's it. And once I get my fill, it's like, you know, you sit, sit down to eat. Right. And if you get, if you get full, once you get full, you quit. You, you stop eating. Right. So golf, I'm, I don't play golf for score. I mean, I'm, I'm still a good golfer. Right. I, I play just to hit the ball. Uh, some great shots, perfect shots, good putts. And I, I, that's all. Then I go work out every day. Here we got a workout room. And I come upstairs and get a bite to eat up here. And that's it. That's that's what I do. They then I go back home and I practice my horn right. for a couple of hours. And I have a few friends come over and enjoy their company. And that's right. it. Nice. So how, how would you say Vegas has changed over the years? Uh... Vegas. Uh, I can't answer. I'm so m not much part of Vegas anymore. Yeah. Um, geez, I mean, very, very, very seldom do I ever go on a strip. Okay. And like my son, James, mm -hmm. was the food and beverage director at the Cosmopolitan mm -hmm. until all of this stuff started to happen. Right. And he was on his way to becoming the president of a hotel. Bright, beautiful wow. future, but that ended that. And I was get, starting to get into the uh, hotel situation. Mm -hmm. So that ended. And uh, I don't, Vegas is right now, I, I think it's maybe five months to eight months away from getting fully back to what it might have been or might be, I don't know if if it'll ever get back to what it was. I'm not sure. Right. But it's it's a fun city. It's a, you know, it's a beautiful. Uh, hey, when's the last time you were here? In 2019. Okay. Know, yeah. Right, be, right, right before the virus. Then. Right before the virus. Yeah. Where do you live, Sophia? I'm in Los Angeles. So oh, you know, Los I, Angeles. I'm not too far. You know, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, do you where do you, where do you like to go? Oh, uh, in Vegas, uh, the Bellagio. Um, oh yeah. Well, they're, they're almost all 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 of them are all the same. They're all great. The, the, um, I do like the older casinos just because it has more flavor, like more of a you can feel more of the essence of old Vegas. I kind I kind of like that, but um, it, it's interesting. It's interesting. It's it's not the Vegas from when I was you know young kid. But um, it's, I would have loved to have seen you perform, though, in Vegas. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah, that would have been so when I came fun. here, it, it was in 1957. Wow. September. And the day I, the night I got here, mm -hmm. I went out to a place on Tropicana Avenue in Paradise Road. And I played there at a jazz club. Nice. And the next night... I got invited by one of the saxophonists that was working at the Sands, who just fell in love with my plan, and he was going off to the Air Force mm -hmm. for three months. And he asked me to come and substitute for him with uh, Red Norvo, who was with Benny Goodman. Mm -hmm. And Frank Sinatra was in love with Red Norvo's group. Mm -hmm. They were performing at the Sands Lounge. And you know, when you're 19 years old and you get there and you the next night you get in Vegas and you're performing in, in the Sands Lounge and here, here you go. Humphrey Bogart, Edward G. Robinson, Elizabeth Taylor, Debbie Reynolds, Rosalind Russell. You probably never heard of these people. I have. I'm happy to say that you I have. have. Yeah. I have. Uh, Laura Bacall, Leo De Rocher, all the greats. Yeah. Uh, Eddie Fisher. Uh, they're all sitting in the lounge with around Sinatra, mm -hmm. and as he got through with his second show, lo and behold, he would take his hairpiece off and come into the lounge minus his hairpiece. Mm -hmm and hang out there and get inebriated with all of them. Okay. And we would play jazz till six o'clock in the morning. Wow. Because he loved jazz. He loved jazz. Mm -hmm. 
And here I am, 19 years old, and I couldn't believe it. I'm playing with the stipulation from Red Norvo, who was six foot four, mm -hmm. the ugliest guy you ever seen in your life. Six foot four, playing a vibraphone with these mallets in his hand. And he told me, if you play too loud, I'll cut you off right away and I'll run you off the stage. So, you know, <laughs> I'm so grateful to get a job. I had, my dad gave me $40 to come out to Las Vegas. That's all I had. Wow. And here I am playing in the Sands Lounge. Wow. And I was, you know, it, it's like, if you don't believe in God, then that's your fault. Right. I believe in God because without God, I couldn't have gotten where I've got. Right. I, I swear to God. I don't know. How, why, why would a young man out of Ohio, somebody mentioned a movie about Las Vegas. That's how I, I learned, learned early in my life when I was 14 or 15 about Las Vegas. It was a movie about Las Vegas. It was not Viva Las Vegas, Elvis Presley, Viva Las Vegas. But it was just Vegas, and I thought, well, I'll go, I'll go to Ohio State. I hated it there for one year. I went to New York for one year. I didn't even I, didn't, I went to Juilliard School of Music, ran out of um, uh, money right away. Easy to do in New York. Twelve weeks I was out of money, and, and luckily I got to study with, with the professor there. Mm -hmm. And after that, I figured, well, I met so many people going on a the road there. That's how I got out to Las Vegas. So say what you want about it, but I wound up here. I wound up in Las Vegas. Right. Here well, I am. You're in the happening part. I mean, in the you know, 60s, 70s, 80s, Vegas was phenomenal. It was just oh, like electric. I mean, calls. you know, <laughs> I, phenomenal as work-wise, we, I was, I was, here's how busy I was. I was working a two o'clock show at the Thunderbird Hotel called, uh, uh, it was a, a Latin, oh, Latin Fire. Mm -hmm. I had a 12 piece band in there, two mm -hmm. o'clock and four o'clock. Eight o'clock, I was working with Frank Sinatra at the Sands. Mm -hmm. 10 o'clock, I was working at the Frontier Hotel with Vic Damone, 12 o'clock back with Frank Sinatra at the Sands and two o'clock back at the frontier with Vic Damone. I was working three jobs a day. Wow. I was running back and forth and loving every, never even thinking a minute about it. Mm -hmm. I was making so much money. I was like, again, the most hated guy in town because I had all the work. And I was stay that way because I, I wound up with being the musical director mm -hmm. of the Las Vegas Hilton, Flamingo Hilton. I had my own string group in front of the shows before Elvis Presley and, and everybody that worked at the Hilton. I had the band at the Union Plaza. And Sophia, I had the band at the Claridge in Atlantic City. I never was there. Mm -hmm. I had the band at the Stardust. I never even walked into Stardust. I had the band there. Mm -hmm. I had the band at the Flamingo. So I had six, six or seven things going at one time where I was the band leader. Wow. So you guess how popular I was. <laughs> when you're successful, you're not very well liked, you know? <laughs> but do you so, care? I mean, you're doing what you love. So that's what matters, right? I'm sorry? You're doing what you love. So that's- Oh what's... yeah, I mean, listen, I'm doing what I love, but I had everything wrapped up too. And everybody thought I got all those jobs because I was in the mafia. I was not in the mafia. If you remember the Bronx Tale, did you see that movie? Yeah. Okay. That was my dad. My dad walked next door and, and begged a guy named Sandy Naples. Sandy, mm -hmm. don't bring my son into your group. I want him to be a musician. Please don't do that. To me. And Sandy told my dad he would not. He was priming me to be with uh, in the mafia. Wow. And I was just about just ready to do it. Mm -hmm. And my dad stopped that in his tracks. Good. So, so 
So your dad sounds like a great guy. He really loved you. Oh, my dad. Oh, he, he, he's the reason. So what so, was it like when he went to Vegas to see you play? What's that? What was it like when he went to Vegas to see you play, to hear you play? Oh, my God. I tell you, you know, I gave him a, a – well, getting him ringside, you know, you talking about a proud father. Here I am. I'm up. I'm conducting up there for oh Charles, um, Raquel Welch. I'm conducting for uh, Glenn Campbell, James Brown. I'm playing with Barbara Streisand, and of course I'm going with Ann Margaret for seven years, which she knew about. And I got him ringside. And she had just adored my mom and dad. I mean, she, she was she was so sweet. Oh. And Mark was such a sweet, dear heart. I mean, she was she didn't get what she deserved. She, she was married to Roger Smith. He was gay, unfortunately, for her. And she kept complaining to me that I'm his meal ticket and so on and so forth. You gotta read the book though. Mm -hmm. Go back and read the player. book, whatever. The Vegas player, JimmyMolidori.com, right? Got to get Jimmy that book. Yeah. Silent E, Jimmy Molidor. <laughs> JimmyMolidor.com. Got to check it out. The Vegas player. Okay. All right. Anyway, I, I hope I'm not over doing your time allotment, but. Uh, no, I love it. So, anyway, uh, yeah, I, I hope I've covered a lot of ground for you. Yeah, I just think it's beautiful that your father was so proud of you. And that he got to see you live the dream he wanted for you to be. Yes, yes. And that's uh, yeah. That's rare. He came out here. He came out, had shows with Gianni Russo at the Venetian, the Godfather wedding. He came and watched us. Uh, he came to Mexico and seen, you know, loved my house at 5,000 square feet on the ocean. I mean, come on. Uh, uh, coming from a, a place where we had no money. So now you got a million and a half, two million dollar house over there. I mean, right. I had a beautiful home over there. I had four beautiful uh, children there. A beautiful daughter that lives in England, uh, who was an actress in uh, Indiana Jones, my daughter, uh, Lisa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, he saw all of this. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, it really made him proud and uh, I'm glad I, I, I accomplished that Good. with him. Good, and I'm glad you had that relationship. That's that's really special. That's really special. And so, I, really, I really want to see your book turned into a movie because it's so visual and there's so many great stories within the book. I would love to see it come to life on the big screen. So I think it's- I do too, uh, Sophia. So. I would love for you to write the music for it too, because you are. Oh, that, that, I, that, I guarantee. Now that would be a motivation. Well, you got your motivation right there, Jimmy. You got to write music for your movie. You got <laughs> that would motivate me. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I cool. guess they're going to close up here now. So. All right. Well, thank you so very much. All right, the Vegas player, Jimmy Check it out. You get a free or a DVD of his of your music. It comes with the book, which is absolutely. Hey, by the way, look at the D DVD in the back. Okay. There's a, a DVD. I'm a feature with Bobby Darren. I'm feature. You show me a feature with Elvis Presley playing the famous American trilogy solo, flute solo. I played a flute solo of Firework Carpenter with Bobby. Uh, I'm doing a show with Gianni Russo at the Venetian. There's a lot of wonderful things in the, on that DVD if you get a chance. Uh, All right. Well, um, and you're going to be playing at the AOF Mega Fest in July. Are you coming up for the I show? Am, I am going to be there and I hope to see you and I want you to autograph Why, why my wouldn't book. you see me? You better see me. <laughs> I better see you. You're going to autograph a book and I would love to have a photograph taken with you if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Yeah. I autograph the book and uh, I can't wait to meet you in person. I look forward to it. Thank you so very much for your time. I greatly appreciate it. All right, stay safe out there. I will see you in a few weeks. All right, Sounds thank you, Jimmy. good. I will okay. say good night to you, and I really enjoyed talking to you. Likewise, I'll talk to you and soon. Let's, very let's soon. say good night to our dear friend Dale. He was wonderful.
Thank you, Del. Mwah. And mwah to you, Jimmy. Love Thank it. you so much. I'll Good talk night. To you soon. Good night. Good night.